Thanks a lot, uh, Mish, and thanks for the invitation uh, to tell you a little bit about this work. So I'm going to tell you about a program that's been ongoing for the last couple of years, where a bunch of particle physics ha uh, people have teamed up uh, to try to help with this uh, effort of gravitational waves. And uh, so basically, uh, we believe that the gravitational wave astronomy is going to be around for the next uh, just for the future of science, and we were very excited about it. And we asked ourselves, can we can we actually do anything to help? And and the way we have helped, uh, or we are trying to help, is by importing tools that were originally developed for computing cross sections for for collider experiments, uh, perturbative tools uh, that we can we can use to try to solve some some problems in, in classical general relativity, which have, have some relevance for for these uh, beautiful events that. Uh, um, gravitational wave observatories are, are, are seeing. Okay, so what is a problem that we want to help with and more concretely? Um, so, of course, this is this is what LIGO observes. So this is the, the data for the first detection of a gravitational wave uh, at LIGO before filtering. So as you can see, it's pretty hard to see anything. Uh, of course, there's an, an incredible amount of experimental effort that goes into having this measurement and also filtering the signal. But ultimately, the way that that people detect gravitational waves nowadays is by by comparing this data to some uh, template bank. So there's some theoretical prediction, uh, which uh, looks something like this: some some waveform that is predicted using uh, both analytical and, and numerical tools, and then for different values of the of the mass of the two objects and of the spin, or like all around the parameter space. Uh, there's some theoretical prediction that gets generated and gets matched against the data. This process called match filtering, which we probably know about. And that's how we go from this very messy data to, to the beautiful observations that we've seen. And so the, the goal is to try to help making these predictions from theory in, in some way. So on the observational plot in the residuals, this is not white noise to my eye, right? Like there is a frequency, to the so when I'm looking at the residual, like I can even you know plot teeny bits of sinusoid there. So, um, I mean, you mean here? Yeah. I, do we expect white noise from this procedure? Like, you know, uncorrelated. So I think there's people who have been looking into that. I think I'm not the right person to ask. You that question. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we need to come into the LIGO bucket, right? To, yeah, yeah. This yeah. is not white. It has this bucket shape. Yeah, so 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 this is what what people do in practice. So there's this this uh, waveform, and then then once this take the inner product weighted by the by the noise of the detector. Um, do, you, do you expect sort of like the minimal noise, the frequencies at which the noise is minimal to dominate the residuals? Is that the idea? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so let's see how 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 are we going to do this? And um, so of course. In order to make this prediction, one needs to solve the two-body problem in GR, which is hard. Okay, so I don't have to say that that solving any of the equations is, is is hard. They're very nonlinear, uh, partial differential equations. Uh, but we want to ultimately solve the two-body problem for two compact objects orbiting around each other and many gravitational waves and eventually merging. Okay, and uh, so in principle, this is a solved problem uh, by by numerical GR. Uh, you can just put Einstein's equation on a computer. And at least for, for certain regions in outer space and for a finite amount of time, one can just simulate this numerically and, and see what happens and, and have a prediction for the waveform. Okay. But, but in practice, as I told you, to, to make these detections, we need hundreds of thousands. So the, this plot that I showed earlier, so, so this is just each each dot in this plot um, is a, a waveform template uh, that has been generated and there's hundreds of thousands of them, and of course we kind of run a miracle GI for each point in this plot. Uh, so we have to have some uh, kind of at least semi-analytical understanding of the waveforms to be able to do this. Okay, so as an example, uh, if one wants to generate around 400 gravitational wave cycles. This uh, this, this was on a few years ago, but this took like eight months and a few million CPU hours in some cluster supercomputer. Uh, this is just not practical. And also there are other, other reasons why analytical understanding might be useful because we want to understand different features of the signal, um, eventually study deviations from GR, which would require a whole new code in numerical GR. Um, so uh, just to summarize, 
nice things that analytical met methods allow is to easily generate waveforms for many, many points in, in the parameter space, even in, in regions where numerical GR might not be great. Things like extremal mass ratios, uh, things like uh, large difference in spins between the two, part, the, the two black holes, and also understand the different effects of different physics things, uh, the physics effects on the waveform, like spin, tidal effects, uh, can be clearly separated analytically and, and, and studied one at a time rather than the numerics that just does everything at once. Yeah. And eventually also study uh, at least parameterize and study the effects on the waveforms of, of deviations from GR. Um, okay, so this is what the, what the uh, uh, events that we see look like, and there's three phases of the of the merger. There's the in spiral phase where the two bodies are far away from each other relative to the short field radius of each one of them. And they're just orbiting each other and slowing down, sorry, speeding up and getting closer. And eventually they merge, and, and then the resulting uh, object just swings down and, and relaxes to its ground state. And uh, and there's the different theoretical tools that can be used to study each, each one of these phases. Okay. And uh, so of course the merger is the, the part where we have strong gravity and it's fully nonlinear and that there we only understand things using numerics. Uh, but at least in the other two regions, we can resort to some sort of perturbative approach to, to try to understand the, the, the signal. Um, so this is the, the current uh, pipeline to analytical waveforms. So there's many inputs that go into these waveform models. And uh, so for, for the in-spiral phase, there, the input is a two-body Hamiltonian, something that describes the interactions between the two objects. Uh, and, and this is some prediction from, from GR. Uh, so there's Newton's potential and corrections to Newton's potential as predicted by general relativity. Uh, and there's also some fluxes, which GR also predicts, which is the energy loss, the angular momentum loss of the system, which are related to radiation reaction uh, of, of, of the two bodies. Okay, and this, this input gets combined with information from the probe limit, from the test particle limit, and perturbations around the probe limit, from, gets tuned by numerical GR, it gets matched against these uh, polynomial modes in the ring down to generate a, like a template that can span the full waveform. And, and there's this class of these models called Pecky one Mari models or Pecky one Mari um, tuned to numerical relativity. Or I am a phenomenon. So there's a, there's a class of these, these uh, kind of, uh, models for the waveforms, which take this input and, and generate these templates. Okay. So my goal is going to be to supply some of these ingredients that go into this pipeline that eventually results in, in the waveforms that uh, are used uh, at LIGO. And uh, for today's talk, I'll be focusing on the in spiral phase, which is where I can do the kind of perturbation theory that I know how to do. Uh, where I just have two particles, two bodies interacting gravitationally far away from each other, um, uh, and and this is the this is what we will be able to relate to to something in, in particle physics. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so uh, the strategy will be the following. So in, in in particle physics, we don't study body orbiting bodies orbiting each other, what we study are things scattering, things coming up from infinity, interacting in some finite region of space and then going off to infinity again. That's what we measure at the LHC. So instead of the in spiral problem, we're going to consider a different problem, which is the problem of two compact objects scattering gravitationally. So this is a classical scattering of two black holes or two neutron stars uh, coming up from infinity, interacting and going off to infinity. And then I will try to uh, understand the physics using that process, using my tools from particle physics, and then translate the, what I learned to the, to the uh, uh, binary merger problem. And in, in, in particular, what we'll try to do is to determine these basic ingredients, these uh, two body potentials, these fluxes using scattering. And actually these things are universal uh, uh, functions of kind of the dynamical variables of the, of the system. And then they can be translated directly from the, uh, from the scattering problem to the Bound problem. Okay, so there's other approaches to this which have appeared previously in the literature, uh, such as NRGR uh, um, and uh, like Tutti Frutti method by the Moore and others, which they take input also from different calculations in classical general relativity, 
uh, I won't be talking about those. I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about a method for um, scattering amplitudes in, in quantum theory and, and how we can use those. So just to set up the stage, so in this in this part of the of the merger where we have this in spiral phase of the merger, we have two bodies far away from each other. That means that the distance between them is much larger than the characteristic gravitational radius, the Schwarzschild radius of either one of them. And uh, so we have a small parameter, which is gm over r. Uh, and because of the real theorem, these things are bound. And that means that the kinetic energy has to be of the same order. That means that they're also moving slowly. So really, there's, there's two parameters which are comparable, which is the velocity in units of speed of light and, and gm over r. And both of those are, are small. And, and that is the per kind of perturbation theory that one can do. One can try to solve Einstein's equations uh, as an expansion in both in velocity and, and the separation between the objects. Uh, and, and this is what the corrections look like. Uh, so, so famously, there's Newton's potential, and then there's a correction to this predicted by, by GR, which is called post-Newtonian correction. The first one was computed by uh, Einstein uh, in the 30s, a long time ago. Maybe here, I don't know, actually. I should have looked it up. Uh, um, but, uh, but this is the sort of things that we are after. We are after these, these kind of corrections and also the fluxes. So there's, for instance, the famous quadruple formula of, of Einstein uh, and corrections to it that, that can be counted in this post-Newtonian setup that I'll, I'll describe. So the, each post-Newtonian order is essentially a power of, the, of this small parameter v squared over, over c squared. And half orders are things which are all, all in velocity. Um, okay, so this is what these post Newtonian corrections look like to what, however, whatever observable we have. Uh, here I'm focusing on things which are uh, conservative, so such a potential. And, and we have, um, which is, and, and that this is what we care, care about for the bound problem, where we are expanding both in velocity and in, uh, in the separation. And each column here in blue is a different post Newtonian order. So the leading order is a Newtonian potential, which is just g m over r. Uh, then this next order is the first post-Newtonian correction computed by Einstein. And then there's been kind of slow but steady progress over, over the years in computing uh, higher and higher corrections to, to this potential. Even last year, there, were, there was like very recent progress, even though it's, I put an asterisk because there's some disagreement between, between the different groups that computed this. Okay, so this is one way to approach a problem, which is directly relevant for the bound system. Uh, and, uh, and the reason why we care about these things is because these things uh, are, can be tested at LIGO. So, um, so this is, for instance, a, a plot of um, made, made, made by the LIGO collaboration where they studied the different post orders that enter the waveform and how, so this is some, some relative, um, basically how, how sensitive uh, LIGO was to each one of these orders in, in the potential and the fluxes. And so the blue triangles here are the hulse taylor pulsar. You can see that the only thing that hulse taylor was able to see is really the quadruple formula, 0 0.5 pm, uh, which of course was the first kind of indirect evidence of gravitational waves. But everything else, it, one can just not see any, any, anything beyond that in GR that hulse taylor couldn't see. But, but LIGO is already sensitive all the way to 3.5 pm, and, and it's uh, predicted to be. Uh, sensitive to the six positive turn order, which is still not known. So, what is this delta phi? It's delta phi. So, so this is some. So, people par parameterize deviations from the post Newtonian values in, in GR, and then they test how sensitive uh, LIGO is to to. So, so, so you can you can think of this as the as the uh, relative uh, sensitivity of, of LIGO to, to these di different deviations. But delta phi equals to one means the size of the, post the standard post-Newtonian GR value, or it means for, yeah. so, no, must not mean that, but we will ask it or concern that. I think no, no, it's not normalized. Sir, deviations from GR, basically. Yes, sir. Yes. But what does it mean to have delta phi of one? <laughs> Delta phi of one is that it's it's uh, sensitive to the percent level to deviations uh, from 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 GR. Yeah, that was an error bar. Yeah, it, it was multiplied by hundred or something. Why percent? I just asked. What is the question? Sorry. Yeah, why why delta phi of one means one percent? Somewhere it says that. So. Uh, I mean, not here, but if you look at the paper, uh, yeah. 
So it means that you detect this at 1% is like you have a 1% error bar on that particular PM term, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So this is sort of the significance of the detection. Yeah. So they're already sensitive to a lot of a lot of stuff. Uh, um, yeah. Surprising this one uh, percent. Yeah, the, for the three three point five pn, it's uh, 10%. just ten or ten percent. Uh, Fifteen or ten percent. Yeah, this is under certain assumptions and and uh, and using a particular way of measuring these deviations, which is they take the value from GR, they introduce a parameter that goes away from that, and they they study the sensitivity and trying to match the waveform. So it's it's a way to do it. There's probably other ways to do it. And do these expansions include spins, and at, at what order? So I think at this at this stage they were just using waveforms without spin. <laughs> Okay, so so this is just to tell you that that this is this is something that is going to be measured. So we should calculate it uh, and then try to understand it. Um, so the, the approach that we'll follow is different. is uh, is actually trying to climb this ladder of terms in a different direction. So because we're going to study scattering, scattering can happen at arbitrary velocities. There's no real theorem. The only small parameter is the separation between the two particles. So we can actually study corrections to all orders in velocity at fixed order in Newton. Uh, uh, using using scattering, uh, uh, so we're we're going to calculate terms to all orders in the Poinsettian uh, uh, sense, but but a fixed order in what's called the Poinsettian and expansion. Um, okay. Uh, um, so first, let me tell you what we've uh, learned uh, doing these calculations, and then and then uh, I can explain how we did it. That I. That will be technical, so I can I can go into more detail or less detail. So if there's some uh, some expert in the in the audience, I apologize because I probably won't say anything that they didn't know before. But but if you ha hadn't heard about this program, maybe maybe you find it interesting. So the first thing is we just computed new corrections to Newton's potential uh, using this, and uh, both in the positive and in the positive Kaskia sets. Um, so and the corrections that have been computed using using the methods I will tell you about in a second are the g cubed correction and the g to the fourth correction. So the, the g squared was computed uh, in the uh, in the eighties, um, uh, and since then there have had any progress. But now we can we can do these computations of of both g g cubed and g to the fourth, which essentially subsumes the fourth positive in order because we we had to have this whole column. The, the only thing that we're missing is some static term that can be easily calculated. Uh, so this reaches the fourth position in order, which is the waveforms that LIGO is using right now. So, so this matches what was computed in 2014, which is what LIGO is using currently. But the methods that we use, I will tell you about, are not exhausted. So we can, we can actually keep going. Um, so this is what they look like. Uh, so you have some potential, which is an expansion in GM over R. And there's some coefficient that depends on velocity. And, and this coefficient I can organize as some function of the lower order coefficients and some piece that depends on this m tilde object. And I will tell you later what why I call it m. Uh, it's because it's related to some scattering amplitude. And, and this is not a complicated object. It's something like uh, some function, so a bunch of rational functions of, of the Lorentz factor, of the, of the relativistic factor of, for the relative velocities between the two bodies. And, um, and then some 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 functions like uh, some uh, R cosh of, of this of this um, relative factor, and and if you expand this in velocity, this contains an infinite series of, of velocity corrections to Newton's potential at a fixed order in G. Okay, and so this is up to order G cubed. The most recent calculation that we've done is order G to the fourth, and that becomes a bit more complicated. So uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, I don't know if you can see it very well. Sorry, what's new? Is it mass ratio? New, new. What, uh, new. Sorry, new is the mass ratio. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to put it in there. It's the symmetric mass ratio. So let me just. Wait. Yeah. Um, so basically, the terms that are that don't have a new are, are things that you can see in the problem it uh, directly, but but. The terms with new are things which go beyond the problem. Okay, so this is the up to G cubed, uh, which was computed in 2019. And the next correction, so probably the font is too small, 
but this is due to the fourth correction and this is much more complicated. So for instance, it contains elliptic functions uh, of, of the Lorentz factor, it contains polylogarithms. Uh, so this is, uh, one would have thought that correction semitics potentials kind of be very complicated, but actually they're quite complicated functions of the, level, of the velocity between the two particles. Okay, and, and these R's are just some rational function of, again, the, the Lorentz factor. Um, so there's quite a bit of structure here that, of course, once one expands in, in velocity, it gets completely lost and, and then uh, it becomes very messy. So just as, a, as, a, um, as an illustration, this is what LIGO is using, which is the four post Newtonian potential, which is just one of the terms in the expansion of what I showed in the previous two slides, which contains an infinite number of terms. So this is in a different coordinate system, but, but uh, this is just a random, uh, uh, some random rational function with large numerical coefficients, uh, which contains much less information than, than these two slides that I showed you before. Uh, okay, uh, so, so this is the calculations that we are, we are able to do, and, uh, and then I'll show you how, how this can be useful. Or not, but there's still way to go because we have to go to 6 pn, which is much higher order in Newton than, than we are currently. So this is the same as what you're doing, but here it's an explicit expansion in V yeah. over C, and you are doing this in terms of gamma. Uh, well, I, I'm not doing an expansion in velocity at all. So this contains all orders in velocity. Right, but for a fixed it, it enters through gamma still, right? Yes, yes, that's right. The velocity enters through gamma. Uh, yeah. So I guess that if you take some like partial results, some of this like subset of this function until they're expand, you will get what the more. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one has to do some canonical transformation to go to their coordinates, but uh, but essentially this contains the same plus a bunch of additional information to all orders of velocity. Did you try this matching their result? Yeah, yeah. So we have all, all we have checked that everything which is known in the literature we can reproduce. We even made some predictions that so these 5 pn 16 calculations that appeared last year, some of these things appeared after our calculations, so they actually check the results against our calculation. Uh, uh, so we are in active conversation with kind of the classical GR uh, community and also the effective healthy community, which is uh, other methods to, to do this. There's also check, for instance, the probe limit, one can take the probe limit and check that one gets the result for a particle moving in some short shield background, something like that. Uh, so there's there's many shit. Also many observables, like the binding energy, things which are observable. We can we can check the scattering angles. Uh, um, okay, so uh, so that's for the potentials. We can we can also study dissipative effects. So we can uh, study the branch trolling of gravitational waves in these collisions. Uh, so here's our result that we have computed early last year uh, together with uh, with a couple more postdocs and student. Uh, um, so this is the leading order in G Newton uh, power loss, like a total power loss of, of a scattering of two compact objects in, in GR. And uh, as a function of the four velocities, the impact parameter of the event, and, and again, the velocity of the, the relative velocity of the two objects. Okay, and and this, the leading order in this was computed by Kovacs and Thorn in the 70s. Uh, then there's been very, very slow progress with the third order computer just in 2020, uh, but this contains all orders. Uh, and, and there's a recent paper by Vini, Damor, and Geralico where they computed a few more uh, and they checked against, uh, against our result. Uh, and so there was also some prediction by Kovacs and Thorne about how this would look in the, in the high energy limit. So this, there's a typo here, this should be Q. Um, and, uh, because they used some numerical calculation by Peters in the 70s to, to estimate the coefficient of the high energy limit, but this actually was wrong. So there's something wrong with that calculation, which we haven't been able to pinpoint, but, but we have kind of the analytical prediction for that coefficient, which has been confirmed by, also by other people. Um, uh, and, and there's also something interesting, which is that this thing, even though it's already G cubed, it's related to one of the terms in the already G fourth potential. So this is a well-known fact that, uh, that this term here which I call M4T, which appears in front of a logarithm of the velocity in the, in the, in the potential at this order, matches the energy loss. So in fact, these two papers appeared at the same time and they contain kind of a self cross check. Uh, and uh, so this, this is interesting because uh, it can be used to bootstrap essentially by making an ansatz that the instantaneous energy loss. And, and it also predicts the energy loss say, in one orbit 
the of the inspire um, at at all resident velocity, but Victor will continue. Is there a simple reason why like there is this unexpected connection between yeah. repetition then the you know, Yes, it, it, I will mention it at the end. It has to do with something called tails, which is the fact that um, you can have gravitational waves that scatter off the potential of one of the particles. And that means that you can see kind of radiation effects feed back into the conservative potential, which complicates things quite a bit. Uh, but this is a kind of remnant of that, the fact that there are certain terms which, which are related to the emission of, of uh, kind of potential gravity. Yeah. Okay, so this is one thing we can also conclude like uh, radiation reaction effects for, for the impulse, say, of the two particles or the scattering angle. Uh, it's clear how much the trajectory is then. Uh, and I'll tell you at the end that this is related to two other observables for the binary, like the periaster advance or, uh, or the frequency of the, of the of it. Um, um, so yeah, so, so this is also some, some result. I, 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 just to flash it to, to show you that we can compute many things uh, to all in velocity that, that weren't known before. And these are just predictions in classical GR, but we did it using these tools from these kind of quantum tools that I will tell you about. OK, so any questions about that? So those are the results. I just wanted to present them. So if, uh, uh, now I'm going to get some a little bit technical explaining how, how we do these calculations. Uh, so in terms of the results, what is the goal of to what order you really need to go? <laughs> well, it depends. It, it depends. So uh, if, if you just care about LIGO, then we should try to get to six in an order. Uh, and there's also if effort kind of in the traditional classical GR community to get there. So that would be the goal. But I think that you know, we're looking to the future where we're going to have say Lisa, for instance, we're going to have things which are going to be in, in band for the whole. Uh, lifetime of the of the experiment, and one should have very accurate predictions of, of the waveform if one has to subtract them to, to actually find other things. And there, probably numerics is not going to help. So just having like very accurate waveforms is uh, will be important. It's hard to it's, it's hard to predict the accuracy uh, because there's all of this modeling involved. So this is some one of the ingredients that gets inputted in the in these waveform models. And these waveform models, they work extremely well, but there's no systematic understanding of why they work, when will they fail, apart from comparing directly to numerical GR. This is because we are seeing the, the merge in light. But I mean, that's the reason. Uh, that's the reason uh, it's more complicated. But if you just stick to the spiral, then it's fine. Or... Yes, but even, even, even there, there isn't. Yeah, so, so these models try to get you all the way to the merger, so that's why they need to resound. But for the, if you were only interested in the in spiral, then these perturbative predictions would be would be enough and, and accurate. Can you talk about spins a little bit? Yeah, so I, I will just say something in the next slide, but we can also include spin. Uh, that's it. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't mention it, but there's like a part of the community is also including the effects of spin in, in these potentials and on these, these fluxes. So there is, we, we have this set up to include spin, to include tidal effects, deviations from GR, everything. So I will, I will explain in the next slide. Yeah. Can you comment a little bit about the convergence behaviors? Is there evidence, for example, that at this G4 order, there's asymptotic? Uh, yeah, it converges. I will show a slide at the end where we compare to numerical GR, and we see how we're getting better and better. It's still, it's still converging. Yeah, still converging, yes. Yeah. You were mentioning this high energy limit. Can you go back to that? Yeah. Thing? Uh, what what is this uh, e? I mean, what is actually? This so, oh, sorry. This e is just the function of velocity that that sits here. Um, so I just I just I didn't want to write these all of these again. But this is basically the. So this is not the energy that's radiated in there. I mean, because this it, purely e looks like energy. To me. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it it is proportional to the energy. Uh, like if one chooses a zero component of this, is the energy radiated? And this is right. just the dependence on the velocity of that. So, so if radiated energy would go as gamma cube. Yeah, so actually, this is something, this is a regime where perturbation theory actually breaks down uh, because you, you sh because essentially you, you radiate more energy that, than it's incoming. So, so this is a regime which is not really physical. Uh, and, and, and that might be why, why these people were getting a, a result which doesn't seem to make sense. So this is like a brown straw, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, normally in plasma, you'd expect that the higher energy, the higher is the temperature of the plasma, the smaller is the emissivity. 
Yeah, but you don't see that here. You don't see the cutoff in the spectrum when you do this perturbative calculation. So that happens non perturbatively So that's an open question how to how to see that using. using so you're it. seeing the expansion of these cutoffs in, in gamma. So. Yeah. Yeah. So so this energy limit is not very physical because because of this issue. Uh, mm -hmm. And so essentially, the, the, another way to say it is that, uh, that we have this perturbative parameter, which is gm over b or gm over r. And when gamma becomes larger than that, then uh, then perturbation theory also breaks down, and, and this is presented presented in that region. Okay. Then, wouldn't, why is it surprising that you would disagree with uh, you know something? No, because they, presumably they did the same calculation that we were doing. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, so now let me tell you how we do this. And actually, we're going to use quantum field theory. In terms of, uh, so you're getting all the powers of the velocity, right? Mm -hmm. Is there, naively, you would say, I guess you're doing this because it's easier mm -hmm. in your method, but for the inspired problem, it's a waste because you don't have them. Is that true? Or in some sense, some of these velocity terms are capturing something that is useful, the, the higher ones that you have? Yeah, well, I mean, these, these waveform models, they extrapolate. They take some finite number of terms, which are computed exactly, and then they extrapolate from that, and they resum in some way, which is not understood. And they resum in Newton, they resum in velocity. And of course, if you have more truth that you, I mean, these models have to match in the right limit, whatever prediction we make. So if you have more truth, then, then your model would be more accurate. I, that's, that's all I can say. I don't think there's an understanding of how much better they are. Yeah. So I actually want to elaborate on this question. So you just said that you guys include all of the terms and velocity, but then you said that for this curly E, um, you're saying that at a given GM over B, you know, it breaks down, the, the approximation breaks down yeah. if the velocity exceeds the sort of dynamical velocity at that distance. So then I don't understand. I thought that your approach would include all of those terms, and that would be purely in the GM over B expansion. So, so the, the problem is that the GM over B expansion breaks down. In, even in the yeah, even in the sort of relatively distant passage. Yeah, yeah. If you're going very fast. Yeah. yeah. Basically, it's 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 a question of you have a GM over R times some function of velocity. And then if that function of velocity becomes great, like bigger than, than the, the small parameter, then, then of course, the derivation is that's breaking. And that's precisely what happens here. It's the extra power of gamma. So if it was gamma squared, then everything would be fine. Because it's gamma cubed, the extra power of gamma is the thing that. Uh, Sort of surprising. I mean, because you know, if you're at higher velocity, then the perturbation sort of acts for a shorter amount of time. Yeah, right, yeah. More in the closer to the Born approximation and so on. And this is yeah, exactly where you're failing. Like one can see this even in the in the massless case. So it's scattering like two like massive shocks or some massless shocks. One also sees this, this issue there. Uh, yeah. So uh, but is there any intuition as to, I mean, apart from the math that you do, because that what he says sounds very reasonable. Right? You go so fast, why, why? Yeah, I think it's the, this idea that this, that how to see that the spectrum has to be cut off at high energies. It's something that it's not a perturbative process. Uh, the fact that at some point the, like the spectrum has to go down is you don't see perturbation theory. Okay, more questions? Right. Let's see. I I'll have to skip some things, but so let me tell you very quickly. So we use quantum field theory. So we just zoom out and we just uh, say that whatever compact object we have is some particle with some mass and some spin, uh, which uh, we describe using quantum field theory. So just some some field that interacts with gravity. Um, we can include the finite size effects by including more nonlinear interactions with gravity. For instance, tidal deformabilities. It's just some operator we can add to this effective theory. Uh, we can add modifications of GR, high, higher derivative corrections to GR. We can just make these particles spinning. Um, so, so this is some quantum field theory. And you ask, how, how does this know about, about these classical um, corrections? And so there's a simple example. So if, we, if I compute this Feynman diagram, so this is just graviton exchange. It looks something like this, which is 
looks like GM over the momentum transfer square times some function of velocity. And uh, so this is some graviton exchange. And if I, if I just for, do the Fourier transform of this diagram, then I get precisely the, the, uh, the gravitational potential. So the leading order in velocity is just Newton. The higher orders are, uh, are um, kind of these, these corrections computed by Einstein in this, in this case. Uh, so, so this is basically what, what we do. We compute scattering amplitudes uh, using diagram and diagrams or other methods, and, and, um, and we extract a potential for this. So more, more concretely, whenever we have loops in this expansion, those loops encode, they have more powers of G Newton, which is our predictive parameters, and they encode the nonlinearities in the, in the gravitational interactions. So for instance, you see that here, the two loops we have already like, uh, I think I didn't draw any diagrams. I, you, you can see this. So the thick lines are the massive particles, the thin lines are the gravitons, and, and they interact among themselves. So we see that, that kind of GR kicks in. Um, okay, so more concretely. Can I ask you, so, 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 uh, we don't really care about the H bar, right? We will take the H bar going yeah. to so right. all of these loops. Some yeah. of them must be H bar stuff that I don't care. Yeah, so for instance, if you had a loop like this, So this is like honestly quantum. This would be like right. a quantum correction to Newton, and that we don't care about. And this is precisely what I'm going to say now. Uh, you're going to tell me how to know when I look at the diagram what it is h bar. And what it yes, is. it's it's very easy to count. Basically, if if it's non-analytic in in the momentum transfer, it's a long distance piece. And then how many powers of so so there's three scales here. There's a Compton wavelength of the particle. There's a Schwarzschild radius and a separation. Uh, um, so there's two ratios, two small ratios, Q over the mass, uh, and then GM times Q. Um, so the Q over the mass in, 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 uh, basically controls the quantum corrections. So we don't care about powers of Q over the mass. We care about powers of G and times Q. Okay, so if you can compute the, the piece of the diagram, which is of the right order in GM times Q, um, then that, that encodes some classical correction. Uh, yeah. And I don't know, like, uh, so in the scattering amplitudes, you, you assume that some, there is some in state and then some out state also propagates to be P. Mm -hmm. But in this case, they will not, they will expire and then merge into something. So, so this is the scattering problem. So I'm going to so start with just, the scattering problem. And then you just assume that this, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it will go out, but then I'm going to extract a potential that also describes the inspire. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so anyway, these, these are the two small parameters and how I know which piece of the diagram is classical or quantum. In, in particular, I have to compute some integrals and, and then essentially the order of the loop momentum will tell me also whether I'm in the classical regime or the quantum regime. So if, I, if the order of the loop momentum is of the order of the mass of the particle, these are very hard gravitons. So these are actually quantum corrections. If the, if, um, the loop momentum is of the order of the momentum transfer. This is kind of m over the angular momentum. So angular momentum it's uh, large in, in when h bar goes to zero because it has it's basically has a one over h bar, uh, and um, and that is that is a classical correction. So we know we have some counting rules of how to see which diagrams contribute, which which ones uh, which ones not, and similarly uh, how we extract potentials from this. Uh, so. So if we just have some like off-shell graviton, we can integrate it out. We can zoom out again and replace it by some non-local potential. So this is just, typically we don't integrate out massless particles in the quantum field theory, but in this case we can because they're, they're off-shell. Um, and, and essentially there's different kinds of gravitons depending on their, the scaling of their form moment I would expect the velocity of the object. So if I have that the uh, energy is much smaller than their spatial momentum, um, it's suppressed by the by the velocity, then then effectively that that means that it's off shell. It cannot satisfy like e squared equals p squared, and and then we can integrate it out, and that that is what encodes some conservative potential, and and then the other ones which are on shell encode the radiation, and we can cleanly separate the two like conservative effects and radiative effects up until a given order. Uh, and in practice, the way we extract this potential is using some effective field theory. So we just say, whatever I had, which was full GR, I want to forget about gravitons. I will just, I just will have a potential that makes two bodies interact. And I can write a theory that describes that. 
I can compute the amplitude in that theory, which is a sum over very simple diagrams where I just insert this, this potential that describes what happens when four particles come together. And, and I just require that that amplitude matches the amplitude in GR that, that I can compute using other methods, which I'll mention. So this is the strategy. The strategy is we compute scattering amplitudes, we match to a potential, a theory that only describes two body interactions, and, and that's how we can extract the, these corrections in this potential. Uh, so there's some annoyance, which is that these amplitudes are not classical objects, uh, right? Uh, they're quantum mechanical objects, and that means that an amplitude actually is not classical, has super classical terms, have things which go like one over h bar to some power. Um, and and this is this is annoying, and it's also this, these pieces which we are not interested in because they're just iterations of the classical. So this is just I have one interaction with the potential, and then two interactions which contain no new information. So we need to subtract this piece here to extract the new physics. Um, for instance, this is at order g squared. There's the honest g squared correction to the potential, and there's like the iteration of the of the g interaction, just like if you do perturbation theory in, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics is exactly the same thing. Um, so we need some strategy to, uh, to get rid of this. And, and the strategy is to think about amplitudes again. And you can add something uh, like, is it like um, as if you had the like a canal approximation, you expand the S, but even in three theory, you have infinite number of terms like you don't care. Yeah, so. yeah. And this is precisely what, I, what I'm going to mention here. It's, it's slightly more, more refined than the icon approximation. Uh, so what we what we think it's about this two body as matrix, which is purely elastic. So it's it's a unitary matrix, and that means uh, it's a phase, and then that phase, uh, well, that phase is just the log of the amplitude, uh, which one can compute as an operator as just the amplitude minus a bunch of cuts of the amplitude, where I just insert some complete set of states, and and that quantity, its expectation value is precisely the phase shift, and then the question is. Uh, um, what, it, what, what is the phase shift in, in terms of classical objects? And there is where the semi-classical approximation enters. So, uh, so we know that the amplitude in the semi-classical approximation to leading order is just the exponential of one over h bar times the on shell action. Mm -hmm. So we want to compute this. Uh, so there's some subtlety, which is that the amplitude, we compute that fixed momentum and fixed coordinates. So we all study the semi-classical approximation with fixed coordinates. We need to introduce some you essentially, you need to do a Fourier transform or to do some you know, boundary counter term to have the variational problem with fixed momenta well defined. And that object is what the amplitude is the, the kind of semi classical on shell action. Uh, the exponential of the semi classical on shell action is the scattering amplitude. So, if we can compute the amplitude, we have that object and that contains all information about the classical dynamics. Um, so, so what, I, what do I mean when I say that? So, so if you calculate this object, it's really what's called the radial action. So it's the, it's the integral over the, over the um, radial momentum along the trajectory. And this thing contains all the observables. So if you take derivatives with respect to the angular momentum, you can extract the scattering angle of the event. If you uh, take derivatives with respect to the energy, you can extract the time, the, the Shapiro time delay, uh, if you take the derivatives of the mass, there's a version of the dead by the redshift for, for uh, scattering uh, motions that you can also extract. Uh, and which, by the way, I think this is an interesting thing that I've never seen discussed in the, in the literature. I don't know if this is observable or not. Uh, is this the Taylor redshift? I mean, this is not the usual kind of Einsteinian redshift effect. It's, and I'm it's thinking from the point of view of uh, pulsar timing. So, so, so it's it's the delay in the clock of the of the object, uh, which usually the Einsteinian redshift is something orbiting some other object. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, um, and the average over the trajectory that's a gauge invariant observable. Uh, so this is the analog for for a scattering motion. Oh, okay. So this is an analog of okay. yeah, yeah. Redshift. Okay. Okay. So, so in practice, we use this because it tells us that if we because the amplitude I told you is the exponential of the of the this radial action or of this semi-classical on shell action, we can just expand the exponential and find which piece of the amplitude is the one that includes the classical dynamics. And this is this I, I tilde, it's it's related to this M tilde that I showed earlier that appear in the potential. So it's it's a, a very specific piece of the amplitude that doesn't include any of these iterations um, that uh, 
that that includes includes a classical dynamics, and that's what we are after uh, essentially. Um, and this is some function of the, of the momentum transfer. So since you mentioned uh, the, the column approximation, this is the kind of spherical wave version of the column approximation. So column approximation is kind of the same as like Fraunhofer diffraction, where you have like plane waves at infinity, high energies, and, and this is kind of the spherical wave version of that. Um, okay, so the goal is to calculate this classical amplitude, and then I can extract everything from it, uh, as I explained, by some matching procedure, either to an EFT or to a Classical on shell action, which I can compute with some ansatz potential to match to match the coefficients. Um, so we just need this amplitude in, in GR, which is actually the hard part of the calculation. Everything I said is kind of nice, but it's it's easy. The, the hard part is how to calculate this amplitude. And here we use several tricks. So uh, so the first one is we use a trick called the double copy. So we need to construct an integral, which traditionally is a sum over Feynman diagrams. And then we need to integrate that. But in, instead of constructing the integrand using Feynman diagrams, which in gravity, so if, if you've tried to do perturbation theory, even in linearized gravity, it's pretty nasty, especially when you start including the nonlinearities. So the three graviton interaction for like a linear perturbation, it's, it's a mess. Um, so instead of that, we use this uh, amazing relation that was discovered uh, about 15 years ago between amplitudes for gluons and gravitons. And, and this is something which is proven in the classical theory. This is just true. And uh, maybe you won't believe it when I tell you about it, but, but this is uh, true. We don't understand why it's true, uh, but it's true. Uh, so if you take an amplitude for gluons, so gluons are particles that we measure at the LHC, or at least what, what comes out of them. Uh, and, and the amplitude is a function of some color factors, so something that encodes the, the kind of strong charges of the, of the gluons times some kinematic function, which is a function of the polarizations and the momenta, divided by some propagators, which tell us like how the diagram propagates, like just the poles of the diagram. OK, so that's what a blue on amplitude looks like. And then this color satisfies some relation. So this is something called a Jacobi identity, which has to do with the fact that there's some group which is governing the, like SU3, for instance, that governs the, the dynamics of QCD. So they satisfy relations that look like that. Like if you have three diagrams that are the same everywhere, but they just change a little bit somewhere, then, then their color factor is a little bit related by this relation. Now, if one can arrange the kinematic factors, the functions of momentum polarizations, so that they satisfy the same relation, and this is not guaranteed, but we can prove that this can be done. It might be harder, it might be easier, but we can always do it. Then one can just remove the color, square the kinematic numerator, and that's a graviton amplitude. Okay, so there's a precise sense in which gravitons are gluons squared. Uh, and uh, so, so this is what we use to do, to do our calculations. We actually compute amplitudes of gluons first, which are much simpler, because they are like spin one particles, and then we use these relations to get kind of three amplitudes of, of gravitons. And then those they, we can glue into, into loops using, using tools from unitarity. So we can, we can say that a given diagram, if we actually uh, ask the question, what happens if I insert a complete set of states somewhere? What happens when a long time passes between this piece of the diagram and that part of the diagram? Then these loop amplitudes have to factorize into kind of lower, lower uh, uh, loop or, or trees or lower, lower number of length amplitudes. So there's a, there's a machinery from particle physics, which is what people use nowadays to do computations for the backgrounds for, for LHC, for instance, in, in quantum chronodynamics, which uses these ideas from unitarities and recursion, where we don't use Feynman diagrams, we just we don't use Lagrangians, we use these sort of relations, and, and we glue smaller building blocks, which are amplitudes, into bigger amplitudes to do this calculation. Yeah. A naive question. If I just think about a tree level, yeah. so the glue on, say, if, if you, there's some indices, right? Yeah. There's a sort of hiding in the end yeah. and the P's. So how does the counting of degrees of freedom work? Because uh, yeah, so so there's two polarizations for for a gluon. There's two polarizations for a graviton. So actually, when you square, you get two extra things. You get a scalar. You get two scalars. But because these are three amplitudes, I get to choose my external state. So I can always pick the kind of traceless symmetric traceless oh, part of that, which is a graviton. So yes, there's some details which I'm skipping, but uh, 
to get more than just square feet. So these are the, the amplitudes for what's on the external things, graviton. Yeah, in that case, it's graviton. But for this uh, magic to be proven, it's just for graviton. Yeah, yeah. But then but are you interested in amplitudes with uh, like a physical object? Yeah, yeah, but that that I can get. I, in the end, I'm, I'm interested in the amplitudes of massive scalars, but this works in, in general dimensions, so I can do something like dimensional reduction if I want amplitudes of scalars interacting with gravity, which have masses. So, so we, we can use this to generate the amplitudes that we want. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the stick with massive scalars in principle, like it works also, yeah. Works all yeah, the time, but it's not. easier because we we already had all of these things sitting around. It's not that we computed this now. Uh, so we had all the building blocks already. I guess my question is, I mean, in astrophysics, we, we, my, the thing that's orbiting might be a complex, maybe not a black hole, maybe a nuclear star or something that has some internal stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so all I of that that satisfies a magical thing. Like yeah, that. yeah. So, so this works also for higher dimension operators. So I, I, I told so you that two leading order. Code this in some sort of. Practice. Yeah, yeah. So there's a tall tower of nonlinear interactions with gravity, which encodes say like the tidal. Finite size effect of the object, not special to GR, but even if you yeah, 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 um, yeah, there's there's some magic going on. That's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so this is this is what we do, and then for the so for instance, these are this is everything we had to compute to the g to the fourth potential. So if you write finite diagrams, there's many more finite diagrams, but these are the like we call them unitarity cuts, and you see the most complicated building block is this five graviton amplitude that shows up here. Uh, Everything else, for instance, the three-point amplitudes are just insertions of the stress tensor of a massive particle or something like that. So, so this is the whole set of objects that we need to input to our calculations. Okay, have to speed up. Uh, so let me just say very quickly, uh, we also have methods from QCD to compute uh, these integrals. And these integrals are just a function of velocity and we can write differential equations in the velocity, which are inspired by things that people do in QCD. Actually, Johannes Hen, while he was a postdoc here, he discovered this method of differential equations, which we use. And so you don't need to know the details. Uh, just believe me that the, the resulting integrals only depend on the velocity or the mass dependence is trivialized because of this classical limit and, and the differential equations because they're in velocity, we can use the post-Newtonian data as a boundary condition. So, so the different, once you write the differential equation, you take the leading post-Newtonian order and the differential equation gives you the whole velocity series for free. So it just resumes it. Um, so, so in a sense, that's where our power comes from so to be able to do all of in velocity. And, and the boundary conditions, yeah, they're very easily computed. Uh, okay, so let me tell you very quickly about this dissipative effect. And this has to do with, with cross-sections in colliders. So, um, so the way we do calculate dissipative effects is we use the in-in formalism. So we just compute the expectation value of something in the out state after things evolve gravitationally and we compare to the in state and the relation between the in and the out state as, as you already mentioned is the S matrix. So in the end, we get formulas that look like this. The impulse is, is kind of the amplitude or Fourier transform of the amplitude minus a bunch of cuts of the amplitude, which come from just expanding, put, putting the S matrix in here and, and expanding. And similarly, the, the radiated momentum is something like a cross section, something where we have to take an amplitude, square it, sum over the phase space, weighted by the energy of, of whatever particle is going through. And, and this gives us formulas in terms of amplitudes for, for, uh, for the different observables in, in, in this relative setting. Uh, for instance, an example is the impulse is directly like the, tran the, the, the transverse part is directly the real part of the one loop amplitude at, at origin squared, and the, the longitudinal part is directly the imaginary part of the one of amplitude. So there's very simple relations like this, also at high orders between amplitudes and the different parts of the of these impulses. Um, and of course, we know how to compute all the things on the right-hand side, so we can very easily obtain these this results. And, and so the, for the cut integrals, we use also techniques from QCD. This is like it's called now reverse unitarity where phase space integrals we replace by ordinary integrals with kind of different I epsilon prescription. So we turn everything again into an ordinary Feynman integral uh, and, and use relations like Cusker rule, the optical theorem, the differential equations are also satisfied by these things. So we have the tools to compute everything. Uh, and all of this is directly imported from colliders. Um, we can do more things. We can calculate the radiate angular momentum. 
to extract the flux, so this is work in progress. But there was already a paper that used similar methods. Uh, we can compute the power spectrum of the, of the waves emitted, the angular distribution, things like that, which have direct analog in colliders, like event shapes, rapidity distributions. So we don't need to think too hard. We just need to look at the analogous calculation in collider physics, and, and then we, we can learn what to do. Um, now, I'm almost done. Uh, so let me just tell you how we are going to connect to the Inspiral and also some of the challenges. Uh, and so I told you that once I have this potential and these fluxes, so I told you I can compute the potential by matching to some amplitude and GR. Uh, I can compute these fluxes using these tools from collider physics. Um, then in principle, I can just use those for the Inspiral problem. Actually, there, there is some subtlety. Uh, uh, actually, let me skip this first. Uh, um, so the subtlety is that in GR, as I mentioned earlier, radiation can scatter off the potential. So there are diagrams that look like this, where I have a graviton here, which is radiation, which means that it can go on shell. I have a vertical graviton, which is potential, which is off shell, and another radiation. So this is just this radiation guy gravitating and coming back into the system. Okay. And, and in practice, what this means is that the Hamiltonian is non local in time. So the Hamiltonian doesn't look like what I showed you anymore. Uh, it has a piece which is local, which will look like what I showed you, but then it has a piece that depends on the position of, of the bodies at two different times. And this has to be precisely with the fact that these radiation gravitons hit this diagram at two different points. And uh, so, so what the Hamiltonian I showed you actually is only, only works for, uh, for uh, hyperbolic trajectories. Uh, so up to order G cubed, this doesn't appear, but order G4, there's this so-called tail effect. And so we still work ongoing how to extract the different building blocks, because if I can determine this local part integrand, then I can apply it to the, to the binary spiral, but this hasn't been done yet. Okay. And, uh, so apart from that, there's a more, more direct connection between the two regimes, which actually also breaks down because of this. Uh, and this is something very beautiful, which was discovered by, by Rafael Porto and, and Gregor Cullen, which is that if you think about the orbital elements for the bound and then unbound problem, they're actually related by analytic continuation in energy and the angular momentum. Uh, so things like the distance of minimal approach uh, in the scattering problem and the kind of distance of the Astron and these kind of things for the bound problem, they're actually directly related. And that means that this semi-classical action, this, this, uh, this on-shell action for the bound problem, is kind of an average over different angular momentum of the scattering problem. And this gives a direct relation between observables. This tells you that the average over angular momentum of the scattering angle is the periastron advance that, that action computed. That the average of the time delay is the orbital period of, 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 of the binary. And the energy loss over the whole, the entire time of the unbound trajectory is actually related to the energy loss over one period of the, of the, of the bound problem. So there's these beautiful relations, which unfortunately also break down uh, uh, because of these tail effects. So we need to understand them better uh, if we want to uh, learn how to connect to the end spiral directly. Um, uh, so let me, well, let me tell you that this is still useful. Uh, uh, so we are uh, our friends at at like theory at Max Planck Institute. They 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 take out Hamiltonians and they compare to numerical GR and to the Hamiltonians that they're currently using. And so this is a calculation of the so there's a calculation of the binding energy and of the scattering angle in numerical GR, which is the dotted line. So here's the the horizontal line, which is not very visible. Here's the dotted line, uh, and and the different. Colors are just different terms using different Hamiltonians with more and more accuracy. So you can see that, that the latest Hamiltonian, which is at 4 p.m., is still converging. It's getting much closer to this. So that's for the scattering angle. Of course, scattering is not what we're interested in for LIGO. We're interested in the bound problem. So the binding energy, the same thing happens. <coughs> so you can see that, that there's a qualitative jump between up to order G cubed to, to order G to the fourth, which actually essentially matches the, the um, the accuracy that is being used right now at LIGO, which is 4 p.m. Even though, as I told you, this Hamiltonian in principle, we shouldn't be using it for the, for the Inspiral, but it still seems to do very well. Um, okay, uh, let me, let me uh, skip this last slide. I can go back to it. Before. So let me just finish here and say that 
hopefully I, I convince you that we have some modern tools from particle physics to compute scattering amplitudes and ideas from effective field theory and collider physics that we can use to compute observables and kind of building blocks which can be useful for, for this problem of generating waveforms for, for LIGO. Uh, and we have reached the state of the art in these calculations, in fact, and now we are kind of pushing this, this state of the art and we are kind of we partially merged with the classical DR community and, and we work with them and we learn from them and they learn from us. And, and it's very clear that we still have a way to go um, with these methods. There's this key challenge that I mentioned, how to understand these non-local in time effects if we want to ultimately be useful for, for, for the, uh, for the inspired problem that, that LIGO and future effects will, um, will uh, measure. And so the slide I skipped is about waveforms. So you can ask me about that if you want. But, uh, but I think I will just stop here. Thank you. Questions? Are you not particle physics analogs of these tail effects? I mean, in colliders, You're just trying to understand the challenges. Yeah, like yeah. In colliders, people use similar methods in what's called uh, non relativistic QCD, which is when they want to study like quarconia or things like that. They also write a potential and they also have different regions and they, they never phrase it in this, this language, but there's, a, there's an analogous problem. There's, a, there's, a, there's also a very famous example, which is the lamp shift. Uh, the lamp shift also suffers from, from similar kind of issues of separation between different modes, radiation and potential. Uh, so, the, so the technical issue is that this radi the, break, the, the separation between radiation and potential breaks down. And uh, so, um, so there are some divergences that appear that have to cancel between different contributions and we see that happening, it works, but, uh, but that's why I think thinking about wa waveforms directly should be useful, not different pieces. So these, these building blocks, we provide them because we want it to be useful because that's what they're using right now. But, but I think ultimately we would like to generate waveforms directly. And we can do that for the scattering problem. We can uh, this is like the skip. So one can one can use these tools. So, so the calculation of waveforms is essentially what people in QCD are doing right now in terms of how complicated it is, how many scales the problem has, how hard the intervals are. It's literally what people are doing in QCD right now. So we know we can we can do waveforms for scattering, but they look different from the spiral. So this is what the waveform for scattering looks like for different impact parameters. So for instance, you see this famous memory effect where there's like a DC change in the in the in the waveform. Uh, and okay, so this in principle has nothing to do with the uh, with uh, with the spiral, but but all the information that goes into that should be contained here in some way. Uh, so the question is how to go from here to there in some efficient way. Uh, we don't know. Uh, so we're, we're still sticking to kind of the, the things that people find useful. And I, 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 a general question that I have is, okay, in the future, will we actually be able to see this somewhere in, in, in our signals? And then we will be very happy because this is literally what we can compute. Uh, so so I, I, I don't know. And most people I talk to, they, they, they say that probably not. But, um, but anyway. Can you go back to the slide with the analytic continuation? Between yeah. unbound and bound orbits. Yeah. Okay, can't afford. So <laughs> I'm not sure I have a very well defined question. Just what sprung to mind is in the kinetic theory of stellar systems. Mm -hmm. So um, when we're looking at, for instance, the evolution of a globular cluster, mm -hmm. we compute the evolution by considering uh, multiple deflections of two stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the classical thing, which was done in the 1940s by Chandrasekhar, is to say that two stars fly past each other. They, Give each other a kick and then they never see each other again mm -hmm. and you know then there's another encounter another encounter and i just add up all of these encounters yeah. now if you also do this in a much more modern way with something called the valesco leonard equation which accounts for the fact that the stars are actually moving on orbits and they encounter each other again and again and again and so mm -hmm. the interactions are actually resonant and so on what we showed is that um the output of these two kinetic theories is actually very very similar Mm -hmm. That's not actually very well understood why that is. Why it is that this orbital resonances give you the same, when stars see each other again and again, give you the same effect as if they just scatters off each other once and then ignore each other forever. So I wonder if there's something here. And also you said this breaks down when you add in this time delay effect, which is effectively, you create some gravitational waves, they then back react onto the system. 
and, and I expect well, it's, that. That's not a, it's not exactly that because we are well, of course we have gravitational waves kind of uh, like uh, even in the normal conservative part. So it's it's when when they they scatter off the potential. So so it's not a time delay effect. It's this non-local in time yes. interaction. But but yeah, I think if you can relate somehow the orbital parameters of the two that that was the key here. The key is that this this quantity it's the integral of the same object. Which is this radial momentum over a contour, which is whose endpoints are related by an anti continuation. Uh, right. And I imagine that this 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 back reaction time delay thing is in in the context that I'm talking about is what we call dynamical friction, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which is just how much of the gravitational field that I am currently feeling is due to my own the effect that I have myself had on the surroundings. Mm -hmm. I think there's another question that, that maybe I, I will mention just tomorrow in this, this talk or something, because I was also thinking about the problem of capture of two like uh, objects into a bound, and and one can like using these calculations one can get estimates for like there's some conservative capture which is just something goes over the potential barrier and falls in, and there's also relative capture where you just emit gravitational waves, and then the system becomes bound. But there's a regime where there's a crossover depending on the mass ratio. And uh, and I think I, I haven't been able to find a calculation of that. And I don't know if that is relevant for for the yeah. Well, for binary black hole mergers, people do these gravitational Bram Strong problems, and so this is yeah. one way to merge. Yeah. Um, I should also ask: at any point, have you assumed anything about the eccentricity of your binaries? Uh, no, but effectively, the GM over R expansion it's a large eccentricity expansion. Even though, yeah. yeah. So so if if you want to connect directly the observable. Um, this only gives you the, 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 the logic eccentricity limit. If you extract the fluxes from the observable, then you can compute for any eccentricity. So, so this relation, it's not that useful in the sense that because we are computing perturbatively in GM over B, that's effectively a, a large eccentricity expansion. But what one can do is instead of relating directly the observables, one can extract the instantaneous fluxes, and then that gives you what you want. If you go two slides forward, <clears throat> no, uh, yeah, this one. So, I mean, this uh, figure on the right, mm -hmm. uh, so it says like, you know, number of four bits uh, until the merger, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's you know, four or five, four bits, and already at that point, you know, there is not much difference between the exact calculation and, you know, this 4 p.m. or 3 p.m. calculation, I mean, why don't cover this uh, region with just you know this is this small interval this is relatively short why don't do this uh, you know accurately with a numerical gr and not bother i mean i'm actually surprised that you said the, that you know lagu needs 5 pm because you know if i start not at 400 cycles as you mentioned at the beginning but at 10 cycles and run my numerical calculation that's not that costly right well it, it's still costlier than than Plugging this in my laptop, and but 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 apart from that, this this already has input from numerical GR. So this is not the this is the calculation. This is the Hamiltonian, which is processed in this effective one body uh, setup. So if you just use the exact answer that we computed, you kind of get to toward this before merger. So this is already kind of halfway through the kind of waveform model pipeline, and these waveform models they resum a bunch of things. So I think this is telling you that those waveform models are really good at resumming. And they're really close to the truth. And, and when we compute the truth, we just see that that happening. Uh, but uh, but I think still generating like a few cycles for every single point in the parameter space wouldn't be uh, practical. Well, but eventually you need to do this for you know the last uh, two cycles, right? Right, or, right. For any point. So right. you know, last two or last five, that's kind of. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, it would be better, but. Uh, but I think it's still, that's, and there's also another issue, which is that, so with these analytical methods, we can push to any corner of the parameter space and, and the analytics still works. Whereas, uh, for instance, it's, it's well known that uh, for Lisa, will, people will have to generate like accurate uh, waveforms for extremal mass ratio uh, uh, in spirals and, and that cannot be done reliably yet. Uh, and that in principle, the analytics doesn't, doesn't care, like extreme mass ratio or not. Uh, you just plug in. Yeah, so there's, there's, yeah. So if, if you, so this, for instance, is again for mass ratio one. So this is two objects which have the same mass, 
very specific. You can compare to numerical GR. Many times I get a question, why do you do it? If, numerical, if you already have numerical GR, why do you do it? Uh, uh, and yes, you have numerical GR when the mass ratio is one and, and, and someone already run the simulation. Yeah. So, I don't know, this is not a very well defined question, but you, you're trying to compute this and you something, okay, and you're going into some very complicated uh, additional stuff, quantum mechanics, blah, 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 right? Now, why is this useful? Is this because there is some structure underlying this uh, classical thing that you've uncovered, or is it that the QCD people have done a lot of work in the more complicated problem, and so you're just borrowing stuff that is much more complicated, but it's easier to take some limit of the complicated thing because it's already done. It's both. Uh, yeah, because for instance, one of the things that we have in, in quantum mechanics, which we don't have in the classical theory is unitarity. And unitarity gives us a way to build more complicated processes from simpler processes. And in classical mechanics, you just solve the equation of motion and there is no sense in which you can do that. You just iterate the equation of motion perturbatively and you, you go to- the any, any perturbative Hamiltonian system can be looked at in this way as a bunch of Feynman diagrams. Yeah, yeah. so that is just the perturbation theory itself. But, uh, but in addition to that, the, the advantage is that we don't use Feynman diagrams. We right. just, we use these tools from, for instance, this double copy that I mentioned, what is it? <laughs> but this is still a way of counting up interactions that could be written as Feynman diagrams. Yeah, yeah. so if you were infinitely powerful and you could compute any Feynman diagram to any order, uh, but that is not very difficult, different than the standard calculation classically that people would That's right. get the exact same integrals. It's just That's right. another ordering. Yeah. But you are gaining from something else. Yeah. Not yeah. Time and time. We're, we're gaining like because of this. Stuff magical. Right? Yeah. yeah. Here, so, the magic is here. The magic is this double copy and, uh, and the, the fact that we can use unitarity to build, to build these things like. So every single input here, it's not some off-shell thing that depends on some gauge. Uh, so when you do, when you solve equation of motion, when you solve classical GR, you need to choose a gauge right. and you need to choose coordinates. Here we're using amplitudes. Amplitudes are gauge invariant. So every single building block or calculation is, a, is an observable. It's a gauge invariant quantity. Uh, and that then we can recurse and glue uh, to build, to build the, the, the physics that we're interested in. And that's where the simplifications come from. But this is because you're going in and then you're going out and uh, yeah. there's no complication because everything is free out there. Right. But, but imagine doing this kind of simple calculation of in and out stuff in the, G, in the normal GR with no quantum mechanics and somehow maybe I should be able to get back these simplifications. Also. Yeah, so, so people are, there's, there's other groups that do these calculations using word lines interacting with gravity that have reproduced some of the calculations that we've done. Uh, and, and, and they, they also get the same integral. So they've been able to benefit from kind of our import of QCD tools to the integrals. But so far, they haven't been able to import this. So in the order that we were both calculating, one can still get away with Feynman diagrams. But, uh, but looking to the future, uh, it's going to get harder and harder to do this. Like